Chapter 1. The One Boy Insurgency In the pre-dawn darkness of August 26th, 1929, in the back bedroom of a small house in Torrance, California, a 12-year-old boy sat up in bed, listening. There was a sound coming from outside, growing ever louder. It was a huge, heavy rush, suggesting immensity, a great parting of air. It was coming from directly above the house. The boy swung his legs off his bed, raced down the stairs, slapped open the back door, and loped onto the grass. The yard was otherworldly, smothered in unnatural darkness, shivering with sound. The boy stood on the lawn beside his older brother, head thrown back, spellbound. The sky had disappeared, an object that he could see only in silhouette, reaching across a massive arc of space, was suspended low in the air over the house. It was longer than two and a half football fields and as tall as a city. It was putting out the stars. What he saw was the German dirigible Graf Zeppelin. At nearly 800 feet long and 110 feet high, it was the largest flying machine ever crafted. More luxurious than the finest airplane, gliding effortlessly over huge distances, built on a scale that left spectators gasping, it was, in the summer of 29, the wonder of the world. The airship was three days from completing a sensational feat of aeronautics circumnavigation of the globe. The journey had begun on August 7th, when the Zeppelin had slipped its tethers in Lakehurst, New Jersey, lifted up with a long, slow sigh, and headed for Manhattan. On Fifth Avenue that summer, demolition was soon to begin on the Waldorf Astoria Hotel clearing the way for a skyscraper of unprecedented proportions, the Empire State Building. At Yankee Stadium, in the Bronx, players were debuting numbered uniforms. Lou Gehrig wore number four. Babe Ruth, about to hit his 500th home run, wore number three. On Wall Street, stock prices were racing toward an all-time high. After a slow glide around the Statue of Liberty, the Zeppelin banked north, then turned out over the Atlantic. In time, land came below again. France, Switzerland, Germany. The ship passed over Nuremberg, where fringe politician Adolf Hitler, whose Nazi party had been trounced in the 1928 elections, had just delivered a speech touting selective infanticide. Then it flew east of Frankfurt, where a Jewish woman named Edith Frank was caring for her newborn, a girl named Anne. Sailing northeast, the Zeppelin crossed over Russia. Siberian villagers, so isolated that they'd never even seen a train, fell to their knees at the sight of it. On August 19th, as some four million Japanese waved handkerchiefs and shouted, Banzai! The Zeppelin circled Tokyo and sank onto a landing field. Four days later, as the German and Japanese anthems played, the ship rose into the grasp of a typhoon that whisked it over the Pacific at breathtaking speed toward America. Passengers gazing from the windows saw only the ship's shadow, following it along the clouds, like a huge shark swimming alongside. When the clouds parted, the passengers glimpsed giant creatures turning in the sea that looked like monsters. On August 25th, the Zeppelin reached San Francisco. After being cheered down the California coast, 
it slid through sunset into darkness and silence and across midnight as slow as the drifting wind it passed over torrents where its only audience was a scattering of drowsy souls among them the boy in his pajamas behind the house on gramercy avenue standing under the airship his feet bare in the grass he was transfixed it was he would say fearfully beautiful he could feel the rumble of the craft's engines tilling the air but couldn't make out the silver skin the sweeping ribs the finned tail he could only see the blackness of the space it inhabited it was not a great presence but a great absence a geometric ocean of darkness that seemed to swallow heaven itself the boy's name was louis sylvie zamperini the son of italian immigrants he had come into the world in olean new york on january twenty sixth nineteen seventeen eleven and a half pounds of baby under black hair as coarse as barbed wire his father anthony had been living on his own since age fourteen first as a coal miner and boxer then as a construction worker his mother louise was a petite playful beauty sixteen at marriage and eighteen when louis was born in their apartment where only italian was spoken louise and anthony called their boy toots from the moment he could walk louis couldn't bear to be corralled his siblings would recall him careening about hurtling flora fauna and furniture the instant louise thumped him into a chair and told him to be still he vanished if she didn't have her squirming boy clutched in her hands she usually had no idea where he was in 1919 when two-year-old louis was down with pneumonia he climbed out his bedroom window descended one story and went on a naked tear down the street with a policeman chasing him and a crowd watching in amazement soon after on a pediatrician's advice louise and anthony decided to move their children to the warmer climes of california some time after their train pulled out of grand central station louis bolted ran the length of the train and leapt from the caboose standing with his frantic mother as the train rolled backward in search of the lost boy louis's older brother pete spotted louis strolling up the track in perfect serenity swept up in his mother's arms louis smiled i knew you'd come back he said in italian in california anthony landed a job as a railway electrician and bought a half acre field on the edge of torrance population one thousand eight hundred he and louise hammered up a one-room shack with no running water an outhouse behind and a roof that leaked so badly that they had to keep buckets on the beds with only hook latches for locks louise took to sitting by the front door on an apple box with a rolling pin in her hand ready to brain any prowlers who might threaten her children there and at the gramercy avenue house where they settled a year later louise kept prowlers out but couldn't keep louis in hand contesting a foot race across a busy highway he just missed getting broadsided by a jalopy at five he started smoking picking up discarded cigarette butts while walking to kindergarten he began drinking one night when he was eight he hid under the dinner table snatched glasses of wine drank them all dry staggered outside and fell into a rose bush on one day louise discovered that louis had impaled his leg on a bamboo beam on another 
she had to ask a neighbor to sew Louis's severed toe back on. When Louis came home drenched in oil after scaling an oil rig, diving into a sump well, and nearly drowning, it took a gallon of turpentine and a lot of scrubbing before Anthony recognized his son again. Thrilled by the crashing of boundaries, Louis was untamable. As he grew into his uncommonly clever mind, mere feats of daring were no longer satisfying. In Torrance, a one-boy insurgency was born. If it was edible, Louis stole it. He skulked down alleys, a roll of lock-picking wire in his pocket. Housewives who stepped from their kitchens would return to find that their suppers had disappeared. Residents looking out their back windows might catch a glimpse of a long-legged boy dashing down the alley, a whole cake balanced on his hands. When a local family left Louis off their dinner party guest list, he broke into their house, bribed their great Dane with a bone, and cleaned out their icebox. At another party, he absconded with an entire keg of beer. When he discovered that the cooling tables at Meinzer's Bakery stood within an arm's length of the back door, he began picking the lock, snatching pies, eating until he was full, and reserving the rest as ammunition for ambushes. When rival thieves took up the racket, he suspended the stealing until the culprits were caught and the bakery owners dropped their guard. Then he ordered his friends to rob Meinzer's again. It is a testament to the content of Louis's childhood that his stories about it usually ended with, and then I ran like mad. He was often chased by people he had robbed, and at least two people threatened to shoot him. To minimize the evidence found on him when the police habitually came his way, he set up loot stashing sites around town, including a three-seater cave that he dug in a nearby forest. Under the torrent's high bleachers, Pete once found a stolen wine jug that Louis had hidden there. It was teeming with inebriated ants. In the lobby of the Torrance Theater, Louis stopped up the pay telephone's coin slots with toilet paper. He returned regularly to feed wire behind the coins stacked up inside, hook the paper, and fill his palms with change. A metal dealer never guessed that the grinning Italian kid who often came by to sell him armfuls of copper scrap had stolen the same scrap from his lot the night before. Discovering, while scuffling with an enemy at a circus, that adults would give quarters to fighting kids to pacify them, Louis declared a truce with the enemy, and they cruised around, staging brawls before strangers. To get even with a rail car conductor who wouldn't stop for him, Louis greased the rails. When a teacher made him stand in a corner for spitballing, he deflated her car tires with toothpicks. After setting a legitimate Boy Scout state record in friction fire ignition, he broke his record by soaking his tinder in gasoline and mixing it with match heads, causing a small explosion. He stole a neighbor's coffee percolator tube, set up a sniper's nest in a tree, crammed pepper tree berries into his mouth, spat them through the tube, and sent the neighborhood girls running. His magnum opus became legend. Late one night, Louis climbed the steeple of a Baptist church, rigged the bell with piano wire, strung the wire into a nearby tree, and roused the police, the fire department, and all of Torrance with apparently spontaneous peeling. The more credulous townsfolk called it a sign from God. Only one thing scared him. When Louis was in late boyhood, a pilot landed a plane near Torrance and took Louis up for a flight. One might have expected such an intrepid child to be ecstatic, but the speed and altitude frightened him. From that day on, he wanted nothing to do with airplanes. 
In a childhood of artful dodging, Louis made more than just mischief. He shaped who he would be in manhood. Confident that he was clever, resourceful, and bold enough to escape any predicament, he was almost incapable of discouragement. When history carried him into war, this resilient optimism would define him. Louis was twenty months younger than his brother, who was everything he was not. Pete Zamperini was handsome, popular, impeccably groomed, polite to elders and avuncular to juniors, silky smooth with girls, and blessed with such sound judgment that even when he was a child, his parents consulted him on difficult decisions. He ushered his mother into her seat at dinner, turned in at seven, and tucked his alarm clock under his pillow so as not to wake Louis, with whom he shared a bed. He rose at 2.30 to run a three-hour paper route and deposited all his earnings in the bank, which would swallow every penny when the depression hit. He had a lovely singing voice and a gallant habit of carrying pins in his pant cuffs, in case his dance partner's dress strap failed. He once saved a girl from drowning. Pete radiated a gentle but impressive authority that led everyone he met, even adults, to be swayed by his opinion. Even Louis, who made a religion out of heeding no one, did as Pete said. Louis idolized Pete, who watched over him and their younger sisters, Sylvia and Virginia, with paternal protectiveness. But Louis was eclipsed, and he never heard the end of it. Sylvia would recall her mother tearfully telling Louis how she wished he could be more like Pete. What made it more galling was that Pete's reputation was part myth. Though Pete earned grades little better than Louis's failing ones, his principal assumed that he was a straight-A student. On the night of Torrance's church bell miracle, a well-directed flashlight would have revealed Pete's legs dangling from the tree alongside Louis's. And Louis wasn't always the only Zamperini boy who could be seen sprinting down the alley with food that had lately belonged to the neighbors. But it never occurred to anyone to suspect Pete of anything. Pete never got caught, said Sylvia. Louis always got caught. Nothing about Louis fit with other kids. He was a puny boy, and in his first years in Torrance, his lungs were still compromised enough from the pneumonia that in picnic foot races, every girl in town could dust him. His features, which would later settle into pleasant collaboration, were growing at different rates, giving him a curious face that seemed designed by committee. His ears leaned sidelong off his head like holstered pistols, and above them waved a calamity of black hair that mortified him. He attacked it with his Aunt Margie's hot iron, hobbled it in a silk stocking every night, and slathered it with so much olive oil that flies trailed him to school. It did no good. And then there was his ethnicity. In Torrance in the early 1920s, Italians were held in such disdain that when the Zamperinis arrived, the neighbors petitioned the city council to keep them out. Louis, who knew only a smattering of English until he was in grade school, couldn't hide his pedigree. He survived kindergarten by keeping mum, but in first grade, when he blurted out, Brute bastarde! at another kid, his teachers caught on. They compounded his misery by holding him back a grade. He was a marked boy, Bullies, drawn by his oddity and hoping to goad him into uttering Italian curses, pelted him with rocks, taunted him, punched him, and kicked him. He tried buying their mercy with his lunch, but they pummeled him anyway, leaving him bloody. He could have ended the beatings by running away or succumbing to tears, but he refused to do either. You could beat him to death, said Sylvia, and he wouldn't say ouch or cry. He just put his hands in front of his face and took it. As Louis neared his teens, he took a hard turn. Aloof and bristling, he
he lurked around the edges of torrents, his only friendships forged loosely with rough boys who followed his lead. He became so germaphobic that he wouldn't tolerate anyone coming near his food. Though he could be a sweet boy, he was often short-tempered and obstreperous. He feigned toughness, but was secretly tormented. Kids passing into parties would see him lingering outside, unable to work up the courage to walk in. Frustrated at his inability to defend himself, he made a study of it. His father taught him how to work a punching bag and made him a barbell from two lead-filled coffee cans welded to a pipe. The next time a bully came at Louis, he ducked left and swung his right fist straight into the boy's mouth. The bully shrieked, his tooth broken, and fled. The feeling of lightness that Louis experienced on his walk home was one he would never forget. Over time, Louis's temper grew wilder, his fuse shorter, his skills sharper. He socked a girl. He pushed a teacher. He pelted a policeman with rotten tomatoes. Kids who crossed him wound up with fat lips, and bullies learned to give him a wide berth. He once came upon Pete in their front yard, in a standoff with another boy. Both boys had their fists in front of their chins, each waiting for the other to swing. Louis can't stand it, remembered Pete. He's standing there. Hit him, Pete! Hit him, Pete! I'm waiting there, and all of a sudden, Louis turns around and smacks this guy right in the gut. And then he runs. Anthony Zamperini was at his wit's end. The police always seemed to be on the front porch, trying to talk sense into Louis. There were neighbors to be apologized to and damages to be compensated for with money that Anthony couldn't spare. Adoring his son, but exasperated by his behavior, Anthony delivered frequent, forceful spankings. Once, after he'd caught Louis wiggling through a window in the middle of the night, he delivered a kick to the rear so forceful that it lifted Louis off the floor. Louis absorbed the punishment in tearless silence, then committed the same crimes again, just to show he could. Louis's mother, Louise, took a different tack. Louis was a copy of herself, right down to the vivid blue eyes. When pushed, she shoved. Sold a bad cut of meat, she'd march down to the butcher, frying pan in hand. Loving mischief, she spread icing over a cardboard box and presented it as a birthday cake to a neighbor, who promptly got the knife stuck. When Pete told her he'd drink his castor oil if she gave him a box of candy, she agreed, watched him drink it, then handed him an empty candy box. You only asked for the box, honey, she said with a smile. That's all I got. And she understood Louis's restiveness, one Halloween, she dressed as a boy and raced around town trick-or-treating with Louis and Pete. A gang of kids, thinking she was one of the local toughs, tackled her and tried to steal her pants. Little Louise Zamperini, mother of four, was deep in the melee when the cops picked her up for brawling. Knowing that punishing Louis would only provoke his defiance, Louise took a surreptitious route toward reforming him. In search of an informant, she worked over Louis's schoolmates with homemade pie and turned up a soft boy named Hugh, whose sweet tooth was Louis's undoing. Louise suddenly knew everything Louis was up to, and her children wondered if she had developed psychic powers. Sure that Sylvia was snitching, Louis refused to sit at the supper table with her eating his meals in spiteful solitude off the open oven door. He once became so enraged with her that he chased her around the block. Outrunning Louis for the only time in her life, Sylvia cut down the alley and dove into her father's work shed. Louis flushed her out by feeding his three-foot-long pet snake into the crawl space. She then locked herself in the family car and didn't come out for an entire afternoon. It was a matter of life and death, she said, some 75 years later. 
For all her efforts, Louise couldn't change Louis. He ran away and wandered around San Diego for days, sleeping under a highway overpass. He tried to ride a steer in a pasture, got tossed onto the ragged edge of a fallen tree, and limped home with his gashed knee bound in a handkerchief. Twenty-seven stitches didn't tame him. He hit one kid so hard that he broke his nose. He upended another boy and stuffed paper towels in his mouth. Parents forbade their kids from going near him. A farmer, furious over Louis's robberies, loaded his shotgun with rock salt and blasted him in the tail. Louis beat one kid so badly, leaving him unconscious in a ditch that he was afraid he'd killed him. When Louise saw the blood on Louis's fists, she burst into tears. As Louis prepared to start Torrance High, he was looking less like an impish kid and more like a dangerous young man. High school would be the end of his education. There was no money for college. Anthony's paycheck ran out before the week's end forcing Louise to improvise meals out of eggplant, milk, stale bread, wild mushrooms, and rabbits that Louis and Pete shot in the fields. With flunking grades and no skills, Louis had no chance for a scholarship. It was unlikely that he could land a job. The depression had come, and the unemployment rate was nearing 25%. Louis had no real ambitions, If asked what he wanted to be, his answer would have been cowboy. In the 1930s, America was infatuated with the pseudoscience of eugenics and its promise of strengthening the human race by culling the unfit from the genetic pool. Along with the feeble-minded, insane, and criminal, those so classified included women who had sex out of wedlock, considered a mental illness, orphans, the disabled, the poor, the homeless, epileptics, masturbators, the blind and the deaf, alcoholics, and girls whose genitals exceeded certain measurements. Some eugenicists advocated euthanasia, and in mental hospitals this was quietly carried out on scores of people through lethal neglect, or outright murder. At one Illinois mental hospital, new patients were dosed with milk from cows infected with tuberculosis, in the belief that only the undesirable would perish. As many as four in ten of these patients died. A more popular tool of eugenics was forced sterilization, employed on a raft of lost souls who, through misbehavior or misfortune, fell into the hands of state governments. By 1930, when Louis was entering his teens, California was enraptured with eugenics and would ultimately sterilize some 20,000 people. When Louis was in his early teens, an event in Torrance brought reality home. A kid from Louis's neighborhood was deemed feeble-minded, institutionalized, and barely saved from sterilization through a frantic legal effort by his parents, funded by their Torrance neighbors. Tutored by Louis's siblings, the boy earned straight A's. Louis was never more than an inch from juvenile hall or jail, and as a serial troublemaker, a failing student, and a suspect Italian, he was just the sort of rogue that eugenicists wanted to cull. Suddenly understanding what he was risking, He felt deeply shaken. The person that Louis had become was not, he knew, his authentic self. He made hesitant efforts to connect to others. He scrubbed the kitchen floor to surprise his mother, but she assumed that Pete had done it. While his father was out of town, Louis overhauled the engine on the family's Marmon Roosevelt Straight 8 sedan. He baked biscuits and gave them away, When his mother, tired of the mess, booted him from her kitchen, he resumed baking in a neighbor's house. He doled out nearly everything he stole. He was big-hearted, said Pete. Louis would give away anything, whether it was his or not. 
each attempt he made to right himself ended wrong. He holed up alone, reading Zane Grey novels and wishing himself into them, a man and his horse on the frontier, broken off from the world. He haunted the theater for western movies, losing track of the plots while he stared at the scenery. On some nights he'd drag his bedding into the yard to sleep alone. On others he'd lie awake in bed, beneath pinups of movie cowboy Tom Mix and his wonder horse Tony, feeling snared on something from which he couldn't kick free. In the back bedroom he could hear trains passing. Lying beside his sleeping brother, he'd listen to the broad, low sound, faint, then rising, faint again, then a high, beckoning whistle, then gone. The sound of it brought goosebumps. Lost in longing, Louis imagined himself on a train, rolling into country he couldn't see, growing smaller and more distant, until he disappeared. <laughs>